as Catherine said, sort of exploring creative approaches to working with, with children and young people is, is really important. Um, and what I'm going to try and do is sort of combine some different aspects of thinking about that, both in terms of, you know, why is it that we might look at, at creative methods for working with children and young people, but also thinking through, you know, some of the debates, some of the challenges around thinking about using these different approaches. So I'm just going to start my um, PowerPoint um, and hopefully that's now visible to you and I'm going to move that over there um, and that over there. Um, so hopefully what you're seeing is the PowerPoint itself now. Um, so Lydia, who was due to present this with me, is someone who's much more embedded in using comic materials in a variety of ways. And Lydia and I have been working together um, for quite a while now on a particular project involving using comics as an example of creative methods for working with young people. And when we um, developed this talk, the idea is that Lydia would do the first half talking about our work involved in making this comic that I'm going to talk us through. Um, and then I would talk in the second half about a separate research project, which was um, much more about exploring kind of issues about meaning and identity through the use of creative methods. So the idea is that we'll contrast um, first half looking at a very applied use of creative methods um, in the form of a patient information sheet designed as a comic. And then the second half looking at um, research, looking at creative methods as a way of exploring in quite kind of in-depth conceptual ways how children think about their identity and looking at the role of creative methods as an approach that potentially gives greater voice to children within research processes by tapping in to their research, to their own um, imagination. So the first half we'll be talking about my MRI, which if you can see is the first half of the, the image there. And then the second image, task four, which is a drawing of a child's hand with different words put on it, physio, test, splints, medication, doctors, this was drawn by a, a young person in the other research project that I'm going to talk about. Um, so let's first of all move on to the MRI. Um, oops, is this moving forward for people? Why is that not? Yeah, right. it has now, Janice. Yeah, and I've, I've done the introduction so we can skip on to that. So my MRI. Um, so my MRI came out of um, some interest that actually came out from the hospital rather than from us but it was an interest in trying to develop for young people better information that explains to them what happens if they were having an MRI and our interest in getting involved in that project came from our interest in the sort of you know the politics the values of seeing children as having the right to make decisions in their healthcare, um, to participate in decisions about what will happen to them. And an interest in, well, part of that is giving children and young people the kind of information that will allow them to understand what is happening to them, for it to be accessible, for it to be interesting, for them to be engaged in this information. And um, we know a lot of um, patient information material can be quite you know, it's describing things, it, it can be saying things in quite kind of instrumental terms and in quite medicalized terms. So we had a long term interest in thinking about how do you design materials for children that actually is a little bit more engaged with their perspectives and a little bit more something that they can understand and think about. At the same time, radiography had this issue with MRIs, and this is radiography at the children, the Great North Children's Hospital. They were aware that children who were having MRIs at the clinic were struggling to sort of follow the procedures that they're meant to follow, and in particular, that they're meant to sort of stay very still when an MRI is happening in order for the images to be taken. Um, 
but they didn't see the problem as children's compliance with following the instructions. They saw the problem as being with the instructions. How do we explain what happens in an MRI in a way that children can feel more comfortable um, with the process? I'm kind of realised I haven't explained what an MRI is and I'm kind of assuming that you know what it is, but basically it's a very large scanner that someone will go into um, and then lies very still where images are taken of particular parts of their bodies. Um, but when it's happening, one of the things that occurs is the machine itself makes an incredibly loud noise. So while that child or any patient is lying in the MRI, if they lie very still for sometimes quite a period of time while this massive whirring sound is happening around them. So there's lots for the children to understand about what's happening when a, an MRI is, is taking place, but also to try and explain to them the importance of lying still and, and following the instructions that the radiographers give them. So the radiographers reached out to um, social scientists, creative practice people at the University at Newcastle and asked if we could sort of come along and, and discuss and advise on ways in which they could change the, the information that the children received to you know, try to help the children understand better what was happening. So from this process, a, a gradually a collaboration developed between different researchers at the university, between the radiography team, um, other hospital actors who were keen to see the work take place and also eventually a comic designer. Um, so the early discussions were quite broad about exploring sorry, different approaches that one could use to creating an information sheet that would be more, more visual, more interactive, tell a story, etc. Um, and over time we, we focused in on the idea of a comic as being a way to be able to explain different information through different routes, but also be able to be engaging to young people. So the team that were involved with that, and as I note there, the team um, did change over time, and that was one of the challenges that I'll come back to. But the team at these sort of early stages was Claire Watson, one of the key radiographers in the hospital. <coughs> Sorry, um, Julie Anderson, who was the research and innovations manager, Lydia, um, who's from education, communication and language sciences at the university, myself from sociology and Heather Wilson, who we hired as the comic developer. So across that team is a real mix of interdisciplinary experience, of institutional position, you know, so part of creating a collaboration using creative methods, can quite often be pulling expertise from different you know, disciplinary areas, different institutions, and that in itself can be one of the things to actually work through and think about in using creative methods. Um, so we kind of talked about this process of bringing the team together as being a kind of collaborative process of making a comic through a series of conversations. And if you can see the image on the screen, this was an image um, Heather created to kind of represent the different actors that were involved in this process. Patients, um, both young people and their families, comic um, artists and writers, people like Heather, people like Lydia, um, and also clinical specialists who come with the knowledge of what this process is, what's involved in having an MRI. So it was a series of multiple conversations that involved each of these actors that led to the production of the comic. Um, one of the things, and we've written this up a bit, um, and we've got a book chapter coming out soon, we did work with a young person's advisory group as the hospital at the hospital as our way of tapping in to children and young people. So I would say that that's a comparatively limited example of bringing children and young people into the process of actually making the comic itself. Um, and if I had a longer time, I'd tell you the longer processes we've sought to um, get funding 
and get approvals to have more engagement with children and young people as part of the comment making process. But that's on hold at the minute and might come up as part of the Q&A. But what's important to reflect on is these multiple different levels of conversation and interaction and activity are all part of trying to map out what you're trying to do. And we were relatively lucky that we did receive some funding that helped us to kind of build the team, build the conversations, have the kind of interactions that allowed us to shape what the comic would look like. So this is just one example of one page as one of the things that Lydia wanted me to really stress is that the process of making a comic is not simple and don't you think that um, but it is important to recognize that there is a level of, of expertise that can be shared and developed and explored but there is a level of expertise involved in making a comic that's important to reflect on so this is one page from what became a 12 page comic um, and it just shows the the layers of drafting that Heather went through to get to the final final page so if you are able to see it the first image um, is a very rough pencil drawn set of sketches where Heather kind of began to work up the story what we did is we had a, a meeting in the clinic um, where the large MRI scanner is and as part of seeing the room and talking to the radiographers, we then also developed three different stories that would be in the comic of um, children and young people who were seeing, who were coming to the MRI as an outpatient, others who were coming on a more regular basis, and then others who were coming um, as an inpatient. And then we also layered in different demographic characteristics, different family relationships within each of the three stories so that you can't be inclusive of every possible child in, in a comic or any art form. But the more inclusive you are of difference, the more able the child is to imagine themselves within the comic, within the story that is being told. So this is one page of one of the stories that we produced. So Heather started with the very draft pencil outlines. This was shared with us and the radiographers. We then, she then fed back from what we had produced to produce the sort of next layering. And then finally, the final version, which has layered into it images from the MRI clinic itself, drawings of the radiographers, drawings of the children. In this case, it's the the boy and his grandmother who are coming to have the, the radiography scan, the MRI scan. And so we try to kind of put these different layers of experience and possible interaction with the clinic and with the scan into the comic itself. So what we're trying to do by that layering of different images, different drawings, different stories, is capture that within one MRI scan, there are both social and material dynamics taking place. Um, there is the materiality of this very large machine that the young people are going to use, but there's also the people, there's the radiographers, there's their family, there's their history of what's happening to them that is leading them to having that MRI scan. And again, we can't capture every possible scenario of what might happen there within a scan and what is the reason why it's happening. But by having some variety in it through image, through text, through story, then we can sort of tell different possible scenarios that can help the young person imagine what it might be that's occurring for them. Um, and by having very visually recognisable things within the comic, like the MRI itself, then you hopefully help enable them to comprehend and make sense of what the comment, what the experience of having the MRI will be. And I think it's one of the benefits that comic form has is the way that you can have these different interrelationships between word and image. Um, and that can help young people understand what's happening to them and tell quite complex stories, different complex scenarios within that one 12 page um, booklet. 
So in reflecting on what was involved in producing the comic, I want to highlight a, a few things. Um, one is I've mentioned the importance of building this interdisciplinary team that recognise the skills and expertise of each other. Um, so that, you know, the comic creator isn't a, a medic, they don't understand what's fully involved in an MRI, the radiographer does, but doesn't fully involve what's involved in making a comic. So you've got to find a way to create a dialogue between those different areas of expertise. It is a lot about brokering relationships, particularly when you're working across different institutional boundaries. And I think that's one of the areas within this project where I think we would have liked to have gone into children's, children's worlds more. And we had planned an evaluation where we would have been sharing the comic with children and young people to get their feedback, to then revise the comic based on that. But then this little thing called COVID happened, which got in the way of that. Um, it is important when working with comics creators to kind of recognise what their skill is, that their skill is this ability to, you know, hear the experiences, hear the dynamics that the radiographers explain, the patients explain, the children explain, and turn that into a readable comic, turn that into a story that other people can engage with and understand. Um, so this is, for Lydia, very much a form of applied creative practice. This isn't, there's a kind of concept called graphic medicine that some of you may be familiar with, where people use comic formats to create stories, in some cases create novels to, exp to explore experiences of illness, experiences of healthcare, and they're a valuable, really important form of, of creative expression. But within this example here, what we're looking at is a very applied creative practice where you're, you're aiming to create a comic that does something very specific, i.e. helps children understand what's happening with an MRI. Now, this example has been very much about a comic format using a comic creator, etc. That doesn't need to be the only version of A, creating um, visual material or creative material, and not the only version of you know, creating comic form. There are other ways of creating material that you can develop and a couple of examples there that Lydia highlights are we're using photo symbols, using Makaton symbols, using the doodle practices of clinical actors. Um, separately I've done work in genetics and, and we've incorporated some of the ways in which clinicians in a consultation in genetics will draw out um, the different genetic profile they're looking at to help a child or adult understand um, what's being communicated to them and those doodles are actually very highly complex communicative devices that are, are really interesting to explore. Now Lydia from all of this work has created a kind of guide to how to work with comic creators and think about developing a comic or other kinds of creative visual material as part of a desire to create new patient information or other kinds of things that clinicians and other healthcare actors might wish to do. And the link there that's, that's on the page um, is what takes you to this guide that, that Lydia has produced. So that's the applied version. Um, because of time, I'm now going to move on to this very different project where in this project, we were looking at using visual methods as a way to do research with disabled young people in a way that we were hoping would create greater space for them to have a voice, to have a perspective within the project. Um, the image that's on the slide there is taken from one of the workshops I'm going to mention in a moment. And it simply says, say something about you express something about how you feel. And that was our very kind of basic starting point when we were working with the young people in the project. So photography and other creative visual techniques have become increasingly popular for working with young people, including disabled young people. And clearly when we're thinking about working with disabled young people, part of it is thinking about what are appropriate techniques based on the different impairments and needs that young people have. And we may come back to that 
in some of the later discussion. Um, so there's a range of approaches that people are using within these kind of creative methods. Photo elicitation is a particular one and we we'll spend a little bit of time because we used photo elicitation within the project. Um, now, one of the reasons why um, people talk about creative methods be, as being useful for working with children and young people is the expectation that it can help, can help deal with some of the power dynamics that are involved. You know, the sense that it's the adult voice um, talking over the young person and that, that words in interviews can feel very kind of hierarchical and do creative approaches expand that to give more sense of the children's voice within the approach that's being taken. I want to both acknowledge that as possible, but also not assume it is inevitable. Um, and I draw here from a really helpful article by Gibson et al, and I reference it at the end, where they talk about visual methods as having the potential to alter power dynamics, but that we shouldn't assume it that you have to think about what you're doing and, and think about the way that you're working with young people to, to try and reflect on and evaluate to what degree power dynamics are being shifted by the use of creative methods and how much their voices are coming, coming into it. So the way that we were thinking about photography in this particular project also kind of echoes what Gibson and et al talked about in their project that what we're trying to do is involved in creating reality constructing, meaning making occasions that provided examples of doing identity work where participants positioned themselves in a given way for a perceived audience. So as I say, here we're taking a kind of step back from thinking about applied ideas to thinking about and working with young people to explore their sense of identity, their sense of self, and the ways in which representation is an important part in the way in which all of us present ourselves to others. Um, so the project itself was called Embodied Selves in Transition Disabled Young Bodies. And we were looking, um, we were working with a particular focus of disabled young people who were in their sort of late teens and reflecting on as they moved into adulthood, how aspects of thinking about their transitions into adulthood might be affected by how they thought about their bodies, how other people felt about their bodies, and how their bodies were changing as they were growing older. Um, it was funded by the ESRC. There was a larger research team than just myself. It also involved Alan Culver, who was a paediatrician, Patrick Oliver, who was a computer scientist, um, Edmund Coleman Fountain, who was the main art research associate on the project. But we also linked up with Abigail Durant, who's a kind of human computer technology uh, person, and Jane Wallace, who is um, a jeweler who creates a range of different artifacts. And we'll come back to Jane's involvement in a minute. Um, we were working with a small group of young people, 17 young people with cerebral palsy. A, part, a group of them had been part of a previous project in their childhood called Sparkle. And the idea was that we were that now creating this project to follow on with, with some of the participants, what had happened to them as they'd moved from childhood into adolescence. Um, we also recruited another group who were just from a local school their age were 40 to 20, a mix of male and female. As I say, seven to 11, sorry, had been part of the previous set of interviews as part of the Sparkle project. So within our project, we were involved in, in multiple stages of research activity with them. We did a first interview. We then had them do a range of photography work I'll talk about in a second. We then went back and had a second photo elicitation interview with them and then also ran this creative practice workshop. One of the things that I'll acknowledge is that not all participants participated in each of those activities. And that is one of the really important things to think about when looking at creative practice with young people. How does it fit into their lives? Um, for some people, they were quite happy with just a one-off interview rather than having to have this interaction with us over time. This was a point in time where they were building up to GCSEs, to A-levels, 
to doing things in the world and we weren't necessarily the most important thing to them. So how you position your work within children and young people's lives, I think is a really important part of it. We also did um, comparative analysis to the Sparkle interviews. The work was informed by a research panel of disabled young people who influenced the interview design, influenced the approach we took to photography work, and then also into, um, influenced some of the dissemination work that we did later in the project. So let's look at each of, of these stages, I'm certainly conscious of time. So with the photography work, um, we did provide cameras if people wanted them. Um, and we discussed with them different kinds of, of cameras that would work with any of the different dexterity issues that they had. But primarily the participants were quite keen to use their existing equipment, um, primarily mobile phones, but also images they already had or images that they could obtain from, from the internet um, using you know, different kinds of software and such. Um, within the field work, when we were focusing on the photography practice, we would give them different kind of tasks to do, to kind of create a sort of interaction and, and, and sort of momentum to it. But it was very much um, framed as, if you want to take photographs about this, you can. If you want to do other things, you also can. So some of the themes that we identified to work with them on were around disability, appearance, their memories, um, their experiences of change, the importance of support to them, the challenges they face, and also specifically dynamics of pain, which was a theme that had come from also the Sparkle work before. The image that's on your right hand side is an image of a memory box that uh, one of the participants already had that was their memory box from the different times that they had been in hospital and it contained different things that were associated with those times in hospital. We asked them to, if you like, curate the images by putting them into different journals, into PowerPoint slides. We kind of said to them, how would you like to bring your images together? Um, and if they wanted notebooks, we provided the notebooks. If they wanted something else, we provided that. So we gave them the materials that they wanted to work with. And it was really interesting, the types of materials that they then produced and the different ways in which they approached both gathering photographs, labeling them, identifying them, putting them together as an object were all really interesting parts of the process. Um, public dissemination of images is clearly a major issue that one has to think very carefully about. Uh, and again, we may come back to this. By the time that we were, so we had a large selection of images and materials that the young people had produced as part of the project in the latter stages, and at this point we were two years into our work with them, we identified some images that we thought we would like to use in different public fora. Um, none of the images included images of other people, um, but these were only the images that were either of the children and young people themselves, or like this image of things that were important to them. So each image that we identified, we talked to the young people and got their individual consent for each image and we talked through the types of things that we would use it for um, and we felt by this point in our working relationship with them that they did have agency, that they had agency in the way in which they created the images and agency to make decisions about how the images could be used and we feel pretty positive about that in terms of you know, they would say no, there were images that they said no, they didn't want to use. So it was a careful process, it's an, a process that we think hard about each time we use any of the images, um, but there was a process through which we gained consent for what we would do with them. Creative workshops, I um, just want to talk quite briefly about that because the rest of the time I'm going to talk about photo elicitation. Um, but in the workshops we worked with a small group of, of participants where we wanted to explore the possibilities of material artifacts as being able to represent identity, being able to tell a story about a person. 
And this was drawing from the work of Jane Wallace, who was part of the workshops, has used a lot of um, various different material artifacts, working with people to create stories about their memories, their identities. So what we're trying very much to do is create a collaborative environment where things that you could wear, things that you could touch, you could feel, were things that also symbolised aspects of who you were. We did the workshops over two sessions. In the first workshop, it was about introducing the participants to the materials that we could work with, to the possibilities of using these materials to represent identity. And then in the second workshop, we asked them to bring an artifact from home and from that created a piece of jewellery from it. So these are two of the pieces of material that were, were made in the second workshop. These are two charm bracelets, um, if you're able to see them. One is of the family tree, and in this case, um, Kate, um, not her real name, um, brought uh, what you see in the centre is a felt um, material rose. And she created that rose, brought that rose to us because for her it represented two really important aspects of who she was. It represented her as being attractive. The rose is an attractive flower, but also as strong, as powerful, as having thorns. And she saw her strength as coming from her family. So we made the creative um, charm breaks bracelet as a form of, of, if you can see, plastic leaves. And each leaf represents a member of her family. And she started, she was texting her mum and asking her, you know, if you were to think of Gran as a plant, what plant would that be? And over that series of conversations, I think it was interesting the way the mum became part of the process. Um, we were able to kind of create these, find these images online of the different plants for the different family members, took, printed off the images of the different leaves from those plants, traced them onto plastic, melted the plastic and created the, the charm bracelet out of that. The strength bracelet um, from Hannah she brought um, the skull with the blue eyes um, and the skull for her represented her identity as a goth, but also the blue in the eyes represented she was wearing, she had had a recent diagnosis of issues with her vision that were being solved by her having um, glasses that were blue tinted. And so blue was really important to her because it was enabling her to see the world in a way she hadn't before. So her identity as a goth was really important to creating the charm bracelet, but also what she wanted to capture through it was her love of snorkeling and her love of being in the sea. Um, and that was also something that she shared as both something where she was pain free, but also something that she did with her dad. And so what she wanted was a series of images of scary fish. Uh, so we created um, sharks, which I know isn't a fish, um, but sharks and piranhas and all sorts of things that represented her strength and her, in a sense, kind of opposition to the world to a degree. Um, so photo elicitation is very briefly um, the idea that by working with the young people to make these photographs or in this case, these objects and talking through with them what these objects and images are about, that it creates greater space for them to explain what they are doing. That rather than us interpret these images, they are giving their interpretation. So for some people, photo elicitation enables a truer, more authentic account of a participant's perspective. I want to challenge that a little bit. Does it mean that it's more child-centric? Does it mean that it's less adult-dominated? And I want to challenge that because what I want to suggest is that any particular creative task you do within one environment, one workshop, one project is within a broader social world made up of creative practice and images and representations. That for all of us, how we represent ourselves is influenced by tropes we know about how one is supposed to look, what certain um, norms are for what looks strong, attractive, healthy, fit, etc. 
Um, one way of thinking about that, which I'll just mention, but won't go into terribly much, is a phrase called scopic regimes. And this goes back to feminist psychoanalytic film studies. So might be a bit of a, a reach here, but I think it's a really helpful concept for saying we live within regimes of imagery, regimes of representation, and they influence how how we perceive gender, race and ethnicity, disability, sexuality, and all of these things will feed into the images that young people make. So I'm just going to very quickly show some final images and try and do a bit of explanation around what those images produce. Um, so this is also Kate, um, and Kate um, produced these, these two images together of her legs before and after surgery. Now, if I or you looked at that image, we could take all sorts of meanings from it. But what was interesting when we talked to Kate was why she chose these images as being significant. So for her, what she explained is, this is a picture of my knees. I thought, well, it reminded me of all the people that I met and the kind of experience it was, this, this key surgery she had. So it wasn't just the literal meaning of what was in the picture, it obviously evoked other memories than that. So for her, it wasn't so much, here's what my legs looked before and after the surgery. It was the social experience of having the surgery, the friends she made, the time she spent in hospital, the crap boyfriend who left her. You know, all these things were told her that this was a really important point in her young life. And that was why she wanted those images to be there. So the sense of the importance of asking the young person why she makes, why she chooses this picture is really important for the story that Kate then told that we wouldn't have had if we hadn't asked her what the image was about for her. And this other image from Kate, this is her 16th birthday. And what was interesting there was the conversation we had around um, the fact that she was posing in a very particular way before her birthday and that she was posing in such a way that you wouldn't look at that image and read it as a disabled young person. And this is what she said. Well, I mean, obviously I'm leaning on the sink because I can't stand. Well, I can now after the surgery, but I don't think at that point I was just kind of leaning. I don't think that necessarily looks like I'm disabled because you could just lean against something and that people generally lean against stuff all the time in photos. But not that that would be a problem if it did look like I was disabled, because that's me. So she knows that she's using the sort of the classic photo, you know, photography pose of leaning as a way to disguise that she actually has to lean in order to be able to stand. And by doing so, she's representing herself in the way that she wants to. But she's a knowing photo photographic subject because she's aware of the process that she's doing. And while there is disguise happening, she's not rejecting the fact that she is disabled. And final quick image, this is Mark, the wheelchair rugby player. And every single photograph of Mark was of him involved in his wheelchair rugby. This was his key thing he wanted to represent to us. And, and you can tie this to kind of concepts of masculinity, to the ways in which wheelchair rugby changes the wheelchair from a symbol of dependency to a symbol of strength. And Mark was very much keen that that's how we read him. But he also fully recognised that not everyone would see that in the image, that it depends on what the viewer does when they look at that image. So he said, it depends on who's looking. If you get someone off the street, they'd say, ah, oh, that's good. They've got into sport, bless their little cotton socks. Rather than we beat them, we knocked them out the chair put 20 goals in them and all the playoffs. That's quite strong to do that. How does he continue to do that when he has less function? If you're seeing Mo Farrell in gold, everybody's yay, get in there. That's represented in sport. In images of dis dis disabled sport, that's how it is for me. So he wants people to see this image as of strength, but he can't control that others will do so. So I'm thinking about, and I'll just uh, quit, just go through this quickly. Um, if we're thinking about representation and processes, whether in applied contexts or more kind of conceptual approaches that I've talked about in the second example, they are located within the existing creative and representational 
worlds that any participant, whether adult or child, is part of, and that those existing worlds do create ways that create boundaries, create shaping influences on how, <clears throat> sorry, how young people present themselves. But it doesn't mean they don't have agency, but it's thinking about how these different worlds of interaction exist together. Um, Oh, and this was just very quickly, Heather also was involved in the second project and helped us with some of the determination activity. So some of these things do overlap and connect together. And I'm just going to skip that. We may maybe come on to challenges and questions, but here's are some sources of information, the different sets of activities that Lydia is part of, um, and also some references to creative methods and a piece that I co-wrote with um, Edmund, exploring some of these visual approaches. I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to stop sharing the screen and take a large drink of water. Thank you. <laughs>